So hello, welcome, good evening to everybody uh, in the UK and uh, welcome to everybody from all around the world. Thank you very much for being here. My name is Etienne. I'm hosting here for Champions for Earth. Um, just to let you know, um, if you're not sure uh, and you've not come across what Champions for Earth um, before, Champions for Earth is all about educating, inspiring and supporting past and present sports people to act and speak for climate and nature in whatever way they feel motivated to. So we're here to assist and empower getting athletes' voices heard through the media, networking, and also here to support uh, those who do. And sometimes it can be emotional and, and difficult and challenging, but also it's very, very interesting. So we are here this evening. We've got an Ask a Scientist session with uh, Peter Kalmus, Dr. Peter Kalmus, NASA climate scientist, who some of you will be, some of you will know, uh, some of you will not know. He, in my view, is a, an exceptional voice in this movement, and I'm really looking forward to uh, speaking with him. We're going to have a conversation with him. We're going to be asking him some questions uh, from the Champions for Earth um, crew, I suppose we're going to ask the questions at first. And then um, once we've asked a few questions, kind of got everything going, we'll open the floor and everyone can ask their questions as well. Um, please type your question in the chat if you want to, or we can wait um, if you would like to um, until the end and you can ask your question as well. And yeah, welcome so much. Uh, I'm so, so happy to see you here, Peter. And thank you very much for taking the time. I know you're busy and uh, really great to have you here. So I'm going to duck out and pass over to Laura. Thank you, everybody, and enjoy the session. Thank you, Etienne. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I've got a copy of your book here. I'd love you to autograph it. Personal message in there would be fantastic. So Peter wrote this book, Being the Change, Live Well and Spark a Climate Revolution. So we're absolutely thrilled to have you here this evening. Um, we've got a database now, Champions for Earth, of over 200 athletes around the world. And I've just been tallying up in the chat where people are saying they're from and I work out there's at least nine different countries represented here in this moment. So we're truly global um, and we're here to sort of educate, inspire and support athletes to speak and act for climate and nature however they feel motivated to. So we ask them for questions and here I have 15. <laughs> So your answers may need to be a bit snappy. <laughs> Just bear in mind that there's quite a few. And then I'm going to stop asking these questions and we'll open up to the floor. So just warm up questions briefly. How did you become a climate scientist? Uh, and how? what is it like working for NASA? OK, yeah, thanks. Uh, well, I don't know if I'm saying to you that I'm speaking on my own behalf, especially since this question uh, touches on NASA. Uh, so my own path was really long and kind of arduous, um, but I uh, I loved physics when I was in high school and also when I was in college. And so I was a physics major in college, and I was especially interested in cosmology and uh, astrophysics. And um, it took me a while after I graduated from college to go back to grad school, about seven years, but... Uh, I did, and uh, in grad school in New York City, I studied uh, uh, gravitational waves, which was astrophysics, and um, uh, was quite fun. And then uh, midway through my PhD, I started getting really worried about climate change around 2006, um, and then came to California for a, a postdoc doing astrophysics, and every year got a little bit more worried about climate change change and uh, spending a little bit more time thinking about climate change and climate science. Uh, and so eventually I, I started talking to earth scientists at Caltech and um, was like, hey, I'm a postdoc in astrophysics, but I want to switch fields. Could anyone use a postdoc? Um, and eventually I found someone. And so I switched and started off studying clouds, which are really important to the climate system, uh, and then eventually started uh, kind of securing my own research funding so that I could start doing uh, other things that interested me. And so I started studying coral reefs and um, uh, severe convection, sort of keeping with my atmospheric science back. Uh, and then more recently started studying extreme heat. And how, you know, 
how that's going to change and how that's going to impact humans in coming decades and even coming centuries. So um, started to collaborate with a lot of statisticians to get the statistical methods down to kind of bridge the gap between the, the climate models that project temperature uh, into the future, some of them as far into the future as 20, the year 2300, um, and take those climate model projections and sort of translate them into impacts on like our human, our, on our bodies. And uh, actually it's, uh, didn't really realize this before I started, or I came here, but this is a really appropriate audience to talk about extreme humid heat uh, because, you know, obviously when you're at extremely high metabolic work rates, like if you're running a marathon or something, you're much more exposed to extreme humid heat because it's all about your body's core temperature. And, uh, you know, your core temperature is at about 310 Kelvin. I can't even remember what that is in Celsius. I've, I've been thinking in terms of Kelvin for, for this, but that's the uh, so in, in the United States, we talk about 98.6 Fahrenheit. So what is it over in Europe and in Celsius, the like normal body temperature? Uh, 30, Laura, you, okay, 37 C, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then if you go, if you go five, five degrees Celsius above that to 42 C or 315 Kelvin, that's basically the nominally fatal, uh, fatal um, level. So if you're if you're working really hard uh, doing sport, for example, or doing labor outside, doing agricultural labor, if the sun's shining, that's more heat coming in. But if you're working really hard, your your body's per, you know generating all this heat from high level of uh, kind of metabolic work, and then it depends on your your blood flow to get that heat from the core to your skin, and then perspiration to uh, to kind of take that heat from your skin and shed it into the atmosphere. But at too high levels of heat and too high levels of humidity, even somebody in perfect ideal health uh, will not be able to um, their body won't will no longer be able to regulate their their core temperature at 37 C or, or, or 310 Kelvin. Um, and then you go into hyperthermia. And if, if the conditions are even more extreme, you can get above that 42 Celsius level, uh, which can be potentially fatal. So yeah, that's what I'm, that's what I'm kind of the most interested in right now. <laughs> wow. And what's it like to work at NASA? It's fantastic. I love NASA. <laughs> it's the greatest, greatest place to work. Uh, I uh, hope it's a, there's a little bit of tension between doing the activism and working at NASA. Um, you know, I think uh, there there haven't been too many NASA people doing a lot of kind of high risk activism. <laughs> uh, so it's still a little bit um, kind of learning as we go, I guess. So the next warm up question is, how did the <laughs> movie Don't Look Up land amongst the scientific community? Uh, yeah, good question. I mean, I loved it. Um, like uh, the as soon as it, the first time I watched it, like uh, I kind of certain points of it, I actually got really emotional because I was like saying to myself, "Gosh, I feel seen," sort of like for the first time in a mainstream, uh, you know, piece of uh, media. Because <laughs> um, that is, it does to me, it does feel like just kind of as crazy as it is in that movie that. Uh, changes in the Earth system are so kind of glaringly obvious, and yet we're kind of still heading in the wrong direction by trying to expand fossil fuel and, you know, not ending fossil fuel subsidies and uh, still building new fossil fuel infrastructure, like new kind of uh, electrical generating coal and uh, fossil gas around the world. So it's pretty, it's pretty insane that if we know what's causing global heating and we have these projections of, for example, uh, humid heat in the near future that we would keep doing the main thing that causes that. Um, there, I think uh, I, I, there's part of the scientific community, I think a, a minority I would say is my feeling that didn't like the movie. And I, I my sense is that um, it's kind of maybe split a little bit along, you know, um, the lines of kind of people who are more sort of climate moderates who aren't as worried, uh, didn't like the movie very much because I think they thought it was hyperbolic. Um, I didn't think it was really hyperbolic. I thought it was a parody, uh, but it was kind of like really on the nose. Um, uh, and so I think those of us who are like feeling a much higher level of concern um, and sense of 
frustration or even desperation over the lack of action, uh, really liked it. So what is your level of concern, Peter? Like how bad is the climate crisis and how quickly <laughs> is it going to turn yeah, from I, bad to worse? I, uh, so yeah, by the way, is my internet okay or am I kind of like a little spotty? It, there just seems to be a little bit of a lag, but sure. we can hear you. Okay, All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna go up to maybe a little bit closer to sort of um, the, the thing here. If uh, if my dog will let me climb, it's um, it's just not like a stick. So you say the climate crisis is for... ten out of ten bad. Uh, I, I think it's, yeah, I'm at a 10 out of 10 in terms of how serious I think it is. Um, I couldn't really be, it, I can't really think about uh, how I could be sort of more concerned <laughs> about it. And, and that concern comes from the impacts that we're seeing, but also from, um, again, sort of the lack of coordinated uh, action at sort of like, you know, national government and United Nations levels. I just don't, I don't see, I'm not getting a sense of the uh, concerted, um, coordinated, sort of emergency scale response that we, that I think it deserves. Why do you think that is? Why are governments not acting on this? What's holding them back? Um, I think that there's a frankly a lack of real leaders at the kind of sort of you know uh, national government stage. And, and so what we have are basically um, policymakers who are, are kind of like following the public. And so, um, you know, the fossil fuel industry has been really effective at spreading misinformation, um, uh, causing a division between uh, sort of across the political aisle from, you know, between the sort of progressives and conservatives. Um, you know, we have, there's a, whole spectrum of sort of accepting the reality of global heating and uh, denying it and thinking it's a hoax, right? And um, and I think that's largely because of the fossil fuel industry. Uh, so, but anyway, I think wor world leaders are, like they, their, their, go their main goal, it seems, is probably to stay in office, uh, to not like lose elections, um, which is kind of understandable. And that I think they probably think to themselves, well, even though even the ones who do want to take really strong action on climate change, they're like, well, I can't really make that my main thing. Otherwise I'll lose elections because the public just doesn't, it's not there yet. It doesn't care enough yet. You know, there's those of us here on the call, we certainly care, but I think it's important for us to recognize that uh, people like us are still a fairly, I, I would say, a fairly small percentage of the population still. Uh, you know, the Yale climate communications are always, I think they're, they're, they track this kind of year to year. Um, and they have like six categories, right, of like how concerned people are. But that's, that's what I think, like, what one really interesting poll I saw a few months ago, I think, um, if you if you ask people, like, should governments take more action on climate change? Uh, the answer is, is pretty, uh, pretty resounding yes. But then if you ask, like, what's your top priority? And, you know, it's the usual list, like from economics to in the US, like gun control is a big issue, um, you know, immigration, all the usual political uh, sort of issues. Um, almost no one puts you know, uh, stopping global heating or, you know, stopping or the environment or however they phrase it at the top of the list. So it's kind of like everyone wants, uh, a lot of people want to see action, but no one's willing to say it's my, almost no one's willing to say it's my top priority. So, so the policymakers, I don't think they feel like they're going to lose their jobs and not get elected if they take no action on climate. And, um, and then they get lobbied really heavily by, you know, animal agriculture and fossil fuel uh, and, you know, car makers and whatnot, uh, utilities um, that, you know, are, are highly conflicted in the sense that they make more money if, uh, you know, if uh, the status quo is preserved and no action is really taken. So I think that's, so that's why my activism is really centered around, and I think this group too, and I, you know, I think uh, athletes, uh, 
especially prominent athletes could play a really, really important role in this in terms of getting that voting electorate uh, to really wake up and start making uh, stopping irreversible earth breakdown a much higher priority as it really should be. Um, that's that's what I think. Will, I, I wish there was a world leader who would actually be a leader and help make that happen, help change, you know, the way the public views uh, global heating and earth breakdown um, instead of just waiting for the public to kind of get there on its own. But unfortunately, we, I just don't think we have that right now. So there's a big role for athletes to play in this education. And I think so. Pulling people yeah. through that transition and selling yeah, that, that's my theory. The that's my theory of change. Yeah, we've got to get the public to prioritize this, and then the policy and the the real change will follow. Yeah. So we hear a lot about net zero twenty fifty. What is your view about net zero targets, the net bit specifically, and can we offset our way out of this? So I, I wrote an op-ed in The Guardian a couple of years ago about exactly that question. I think net zero by 2050 is like fatally flawed for two big reasons. Uh, one of those reasons is net zero and the other one is by 2050. Um, I think waiting till 2050 is, is just kind of laughably too slow on this. Um, you know, the, the, the kind Probably one of the most jarring climate disasters uh, I think that I've ever seen was the flooding of Pakistan uh, last year, um, you know, where famously a third of the, the nation was underwater. Um, so, so it's 2023, and I would say that we're already at a very, very dangerous level of global heating. We're at roughly 1.3 degrees Celsius above where we would be if we hadn't uh, burned all of these fossil fuels and and put their carbon into the atmosphere. Um, so, so I think we should go much faster than that. Um, I think 2050 lets policymakers off the hook because it seems so far in the future. It's, you know, they're all going to be retired by then. You know, their terms are usually about four years. So uh, it's kind of kicking the can down the road. And then um, carbon offsets are, I would say, a scam, actually. It's um, mostly... Uh, kind of unscrupulous, uh, um, you know, entrepreneurs who, you know, basically trying to profit off of our climate anxiety. Um, so they, they say like, oh, you can purchase this, you know, pay us basically, just pay us and then um, go take your flight and feel good about it, right? So what they're actually doing is they're taking people who would otherwise be, you know, be kind of becoming activists and pushing their uh, elected leaders to take more action because of their sense of fear and anxiety, they're giving that those people a psychological out so they can sort of feel like maybe it's okay and I don't have to do more than just pay these people who say that they're gonna offset my carbon. So I think it's it's not only just like a scam, but it's also prevent helping to prevent change by kind of giving that, kind of providing a false psychological pressure relief. Uh, and then, you know, net zero carbon capture is a different, different thing than offsets. But I think that's also deeply problematic because um, it's just the, the rate at which we're pouring carbon into the atmosphere now. Uh, you know, I when when the world's biggest carbon capture facility came, came online, like uh, I think it was 2021 in Iceland, um, you know, they made a big deal about like how many uh, millions of tons of CO2 it could suck out of the atmosphere in a year. Um, and I estimated how many seconds worth of humanity's emissions that that facility could take out of the, the atmosphere in one year. And I think it was three seconds was mm -hmm. the answer. Uh, so you would, yeah, I, I can't remember all the numbers now, but it was like, how many seconds are there in a year? Somebody can calculate that really fast. But I think you, the, the upshot is you need like about a million of those facilities to, to just keep up with what we're pouring into the atmosphere right now. So it would make a lot more sense to reduce those emissions really fast and, and put our resources there instead of, again, like talking about this carbon capture and again, making it's like a cheap false psychological out, which makes us feel less urgency to stop those emissions. 
So you mentioned anxiety in there. And one of the questions is, do you ever feel eco-anxious? And if so, how do you manage those feelings? Yeah, I do quite a bit. Um, so I have a meditation practice. Um, I run like not very far, but like just like about four miles, but almost every day that really helps me. Um, uh, and then, then just like doing the activism and doing the science some, somewhat helps me too, because uh, yeah, I just feel like I'm trying to do what I can. It doesn't feel like enough, but, um, but when I like look at myself as just like this, like, you know, uh, kind of middle-aged dude who's like doing the best he can, you know, it's, it's, uh, I'm doing a lot. And uh, then I just at least feel like I'm doing pretty, pretty much everything I can. <laughs> um, so that, that helps. I think if, if I felt like I was just kind of like sitting and, and not doing what I could, I would probably get really depressed. <laughs> so you really do do a lot. And you're one of the scientists that really says it in plain language, like almost daily on Twitter, just how bad things are. And I've heard you say that if you could take people to like 20 years in the future, then you feel sure that they would come back to now and do the right thing. What is it that you see in 20 years time that would convince people to change now? Well, it's, that's a really good question. I really liked how you framed that. I am um... I thought that by 2023, uh, with Pakistan being, you know, a third underwater and all the heat domes and everything, that uh, we would be taking this seriously by now. So, so now I, I genuinely kind of wonder if, like, even <laughs> with the levels of disaster we might see 20 years from now, if that would even be enough to break through the denial and, like, actually get us to stop with our squabbling and our uh, division and to unify over you know, preserving a habitable planet so that we can actually survive as a species. Um, uh, but, you know, I would say that what's 20 years going to bring? Um, it's, it's hard to say. Uh, I think one of the easier things to project is uh, extreme heat under different emissions pathways, which is kind of what I've been working on. Um, you know, probably sea level rise is pretty relatively, those, those projections are going to be fairly accurate um, unless you get like a, a sudden, like a very early, huge breakup of um, ice sheets. But, uh, you know, those, the, th the thing with those kinds of big tipping points, like a huge breakup of an ice sheet, is that it could happen pretty fast, but we don't know if it's going to happen you know, next year or 500 years from now, right? So there's there's a lot of uncertainty over kind of the timing of those sort of abrupt events. Um, but I, so, so we can predict that kind of like the, the sort of, um, the kinds of impacts from global heating that we've been feeling over the last five years, for example, they will come more frequently and they will come more intensely. So you can imagine you can kind of take it to the bank that heat waves are going to get uh, worse and they're going to come more often. Uh, kind of big storms, like um, kind of flooding type storm events are going to come more frequently and they're going to come more often in areas that are, are uh, and, and more severely in areas that are more prone to flooding. Uh, places that are um, kind of aridifying, uh, like uh, the U.S. Southwest, you can kind of uh, pick you know bank on that becoming worse so um so drought prone areas becoming more the droughts those droughts deepening and turning into what we call aridification which is kind of like when so drought is when you you have less um you know precipitation than average for an extended period of time and aridification is when the climate just changes and uh you know the average becomes slower uh, and so you just don't even on a you know normal year, you have much less precipitation. So all of these kinds of uh, impacts uh, in the and, and kind of the physical side of things, uh, you can expect them to intensify and become more frequent with every you know tenth of a degree of of heating. But then I think what's extremely unpredictable is how those um, sorts of Earth system physical changes are going to translate into human systems. Like, how is that going to drive migration? Um, you know, how how quickly will uh, migration turn up its volume and, and you know, uh, just have many, many, many more millions of people trying to move closer to the poles? 
um, how will all of this impact agriculture? Um, so agriculture is highly adaptable, but there, it can only adapt up to a point. Um, and after that point, we might start seeing you know, pretty severe food shortages. And then how will, the, how will that ripple into geopolitics? So those kinds of questions um, to me are really hard to kind of make any sort of predictions about. But um, I, the thing that frightens me is I know that you know, with every bit of fossil fuel that we burn and put into the atmosphere, the heating goes up a little bit, even if it's just uh, you know one liter of petrol that you burn into the and goes into the atmosphere. That's still literally making the planet get a little bit hotter, and um, it's like you're you're increasing the force, you're pushing against these these human systems, uh, you know, um, the geopolitics, the infrastructure, the agriculture system, the water system, the healthcare system. Right, you're pushing against all these systems harder and harder every year. Um, and you don't, again, they're nonlinear and uh, they have a certain level of resilience, uh, but you don't, at some point, if you push hard enough, they're going to fail. Um, and it's very hard, I think, to predict exactly where that breaking point is and what it's, what it's going to be like, what that experience of living through those sorts of systems breaking is going to be like. And I don't think it's going to be uh, very safe or very fun or very good. Um, especially for uh, the most vulnerable, uh, most vulnerable among us. So, yeah. Yeah, we're already seeing food shortages on our supermarket shelves here in the UK because of the droughts across Europe. Um, oh. We're not able to get hold of tomatoes and all sorts of other vegetables at the moment, and so it's starting to hit home. I think that food and yeah. water shortages are really going to be an issue in the future. In the I not wonder how, future. In you know. How, Food and you know food inflation. I wonder. I often wonder kind of how much that's driven by uh, kind of yield changes from global heating as well. Um, I I don't know if I've seen like a kind of really definitive study of that, but I, I do I do predict that it's going to start driving. It's going to start being a major factor for uh, increasing food prices if it's not already. That probably already is. So. It's going to be bad. We've definitely got to make changes. Um, if you can be honest, what is your thoughts about the impact of sport on the planet? Um, so uh, yeah, I saw somebody put put that in the chat to you. Um, yeah, uh, I think it could be huge. Um, I think uh, activism is all about sort of social leverage and uh, kind of getting society to change and. Um, and I think that's a very nonlinear system as well and very hard to predict what's going to make a change and how fast it's going to change and how it's going to change. But we know that you know, a lot of people, they love sports and they love, um, you know, uh, athletes and, and stars. And um, they, you know, for better or for worse, uh, they, they look up to them, you know, um, Somehow, like if you're a, if you're a star in the sports arena, you get kind of an aura, and um, people will listen to you on other topics, even if you're you know not necessarily uh, kind of that's not necessarily your background, like um, in terms of climate stuff. So if you start advocating, uh, you've got that platform, and I think it could be uh, really impactful, probably more impactful than scientists trying to speak out, to be honest. So um, it hasn't happened very much. I haven't seen a lot of uh, kind of like um, you know, world-class athletes trying to speak out uh, about climate. Um, and I hope it happens soon and it'll be super interesting to see what kind of an impact it does have. And what do you think of sports impact actually on the climate, like the emissions? So we saw the FIFA World Cup and uh... that was a that was a real, in my opinion, it's a real kind of a, a nightmare, a dystopian. Um, I mean, you had, had speaking of outdoor labor and extreme heat, you know, you literally had uh, the, the laborers uh, falling ill, some of them dying from the heat in the course of uh, creating these stadiums for the, the sort of like, you know, upper class to enjoy this sporting event. So. Um, so yeah, that was pretty dystopian. Something like seemed like something out of kind of like Hunger Games type world to me. Um, and that, you know, another thing that bothered, this kind of a pet peeve of mine, and uh, 
probably won't be very popular by saying this, but I think when sports teams fly around to compete, um, it's a really bad precedent. Um, as you know, at all levels, uh, including like sort of like the, the junior level, um, the collegiate level, all the way on up. I, I think that sport is a wonderful part of being human. Um, but can't we enjoy sport and kind of compete regionally? Do we really, uh, do we really have to fly around to do it? Um, you know, or can we kind of figure out ways to uh, enjoy it more locally? Uh, and I would say we probably can. And maybe in some ways, I, I think of it like music too, right? Like music's become so globalized that local artists are, they're just like, uh, you know, just trying to survive and pick up the breadcrumbs from the big global acts that like suck all of the oxygen out of the room. So in some ways, I think we could have a much more vibrant, uh, thriving, enjoyable, participatory <laughs> experience of sport uh, if it was kind of more localized and less of this kind of like, global capitalist uh, corporate phenomenon that we have now. So I've got two minutes with you before I hand over to my co-host, Katie Root. Um, to, she's going to go through the questions in the chat with you. So of these, the last one I'm gonna pick is just, you've mentioned your activism. Can you just share with us what you've done really briefly in two minutes? <laughs> Yeah, um, I've been arrested twice, uh, uh, one time for, for, for fairly kind of low key type things. Um, you know, I was charged with misdemeanor trespassing twice uh, for kind of blocking entrances into one, one into a bank that finances fossil fuel projects and another one at a private jet terminal, because I don't think we should have private planes any longer <laughs> um, in a climate emergency. It's just kind of obscene. And then also more recently in December, I, I was trying to motivate uh, my fellow earth scientists to speak out more. And I, um, uh, with my friend Rose, I jumped up on a stage at a uh, climate science uh, conference with the banner that said out of the lab and into the streets. Um, because I, I find it really hard to deal with those conferences, which are kind of like have all these posters and talks and scientific papers about how our planet's breaking down and our bias fear is dying <laughs> and like we're all acting like polite well-behaved scientists and i'm just like i don't know if i can do this um like keep up this charade so i so i'm trying to get and i think again like um scientists could be like have a lot of leverage if we band together and in, in great numbers to speak out uh maybe we could maybe we scientists could have as much leverage as one you know, uh, kind of Michael Jordan level uh, sports superstar speaking out. Well, Peter, though, the scientists speaking out and acting out is what gives the athletes and those with big platforms that courage and confidence to go out and speak as well. When they Let's see hope. scientists, about, like this, this scientist rebellion in now 30 different countries, I think, with over a thousand scientists um, last year taking direct action to really just show with their actions that they really mean the words that they're trying to communicate and to try and get that mm -hmm. seriousness portrayed Thank and you for put across. And it means a lot to be able to speak directly with a scientist. You know, there's so much information out there. It's good to hear it direct from the source. And just before I hand over to Katie, just one more plug for your book. If you're wondering <laughs> of things that you can do yourselves, this is absolutely jam packed with really great things that we can do. Um, not to lose sight of the fact that we need system change and need to put the pressure on those with believers. Yeah, and and if if you don't feel like buying it, I put it up on my website too. I got permission from my publisher to do that. So brilliant. Well, we'll share the link to that at the end, and I'll hand over to Katie. Thank you, Peter. It's been an honor. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Laura. Hi, Peter. Hey. <laughs> I'm Katie. Um, so I'm just going to crack on with some of these questions in the chat. Um, the first one from Randy is that he recently saw an article um, that said that global emissions had risen just 1% in 2022. They said it seems to, seems to be slowing down, but do you think that it's a sign that global energy emissions will start to decrease soon? Um, I, I would say probably yes. Uh, I think it, I get the sense that it is starting to slow, but I think we need multiple years and um, don't lose sight of the fact that 
uh, you know, 1% growth while less than kind of like the average growth over the last few decades, it's still growth. So it's still growing. Um, I think once we see several years of kind of sustained global decline, we should have a gigantic party and just really try to push that as fast as we can. Um, but yeah, like one of the, one of the real bright sides is the, 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 the decrease, the, the kind of massive decrease in costs of solar and wind and battery storage. Um, so I, I think really the lobbyists and the utilities um, are one of the kind of main things holding us back right now. And we could probably go much faster than we're going. Nice. Um, another question, you were talking about your activism and kind of suggested how it, it's a bit of a struggle with, or, you know, um, a bit of a struggle with representing NASA and having to do the activism. And I think that's something that kind of comes into play when we're athletes and especially I'm like wanting to go to a FIFA World Cup, but, you know, also want to challenge FIFA on what they do and things like that. So I just kind of like wondering what kind of how you've navigated that and what kind of response you've had from your colleagues. Um, I've tried to communicate pretty well with uh, different parts of my institution. Um, you know, it has like an ethics office and a media relations office and security personnel. And I've made I've made some mistakes. I've been learning as I go, but I try to follow their guidelines as best I can. Um, uh, but, you know, at some point, uh, I think, you know, we're at, at some you, there's there's a level where you can't keep you, you might want to go faster in terms of activism than your institution is willing to let you go so um uh and I'm, I'm kind of wondering if i'm starting to get to that point now i'm i'm hoping that well i don't know we'll we'll see um it's it's tough i would say um start kind of um you kind of build up in stages and you you kind of try to communicate but you you kind of get experience in terms of what you can and can't do but never lose sight of the fact that this is a life or death issue and that our institutions are frankly um they're not they they, they, they tend to err towards the side of preserving the status quo um and that's a whole other topic for like I think a whole other discussion. I, I think it's been understudied, but um, they tend to be very conservative and don't, you know, they're not very interested in their members uh, pushing the boundary, because because uh, I don't think as institutions they're sort of short sighted. They don't get anything from that except risk, and they don't want that risk. Um, so they don't they don't they don't really see that they're benefiting from like stopping climate change in the long run, um, and so they don't factor that into their members doing activism i would say cool. um this one from greg Rowe, pretty hard hitting but is it too late to save humanity and what tipping points do you believe have already passed oh yeah no it's it's not too late um i i think that it's it's never too late um it's all so we live on this this giant complicated wonderful planet uh, with all of these moving pieces and living pieces and we're losing some of it um you know it's it, but it's huge and there's still a, a huge amount to save um i'm really afraid that one of the key tipping points that we might have already gone past or we might be very close to going past is losing the amazon rainforest um and i feel a lot of grief over that and it feels surreal to me and i i still can't really believe that that that's really happening um uh you know and then maybe like the next one that's going to come is uh maybe coral coral reefs globally speaking Mitzi, come on come down she saw a squirrel so i don't think the, the squirrels are threatened as far as i know at least not here in north carolina thanks and what do you and your colleagues and especially the ones focusing on physics side of climate change make of social and economic ideas such as degrowth Oh, I'm a huge fan. Um, I think it's the only way. So, so I think we can blame uh, the fossil fuel industry. Um, but like, if you take one step further back, like, why are they colluding to lie and spread disinformation and block action on climate change? Like, what's driving that greed and that dishonesty and that selfishness? Well, it's this like, this kind of fetishization of profit over everything else. Like if you have, if you have the profit, 
then you get like a get out of jail free pass, right? Basically. So um, I, so I think this, there's a certain subset of humanity, like a, a certain fraction of people that just like kind of really lean into that profit above all else. And it, mm -hmm. it kind of turns them into sort of like uh amoral monsters in some sense um so so yeah the whole we have i think we have to rethink the whole thing of kind of like endless growth capitalism and uh sort of the single metric that kind of determines whether you win at life which is profit and bank account size um and this one, what what do you feel is the sweet spot in communicating science with the public on climate issues? Do you think it's like staying positive and hopeful versus doom and gloom, and maybe tips on how to hit the mark and to inspire change? Um, well, I always just try to tell the truth as best as I can, um, and so I, I get labeled as a, a doomer. I think really unfairly um, because I'm just so I'm I'm. What motivates me is to try to save as much life as possible on this planet. That's literally what drives me every single day. Um, so I don't think that's doomerism at all. Um, but I, I don't, I, as a scientist, it's uh, kind of repugnant for me to try to sugarcoat things. Um, and also, I, you know, I'm not a sociologist, but I think there, I think we've erred way too much on the side of trying, like being too afraid of scaring people. Um, and uh, maybe that's not the way a population of people responds uh, to address danger is by kind of being convinced that there is no danger. So I, I think maybe uh, as unpleasant as it is, and, and I know like, a lot of people are feeling a ton of anxiety, but maybe the anxiety is coming more from this like huge disconnect between what we know in our hearts is really happening and how no one's talking about it and how everyone's sort of trying to stay positive and sugarcoating it. Maybe, yeah, maybe that's actually the problem. Maybe the anxiety is coming out of the optimism, actually. I, I never really kind of framed it quite like that um, because we know what's happening. Like we know deep down inside that this is bad. And so for people to pretend that it's not that bad to me, like that makes me super anxious. If we could all say like, yeah, this is bad. Uh, we have to band together and stop this and save what can still be saved. And then we fight super hard. And then we see other people kind of accepting that this is reality and not kind of gaslighting and then also fighting alongside us super hard. And then we see things actually start to change for the better. Like the person who mentioned that maybe global emissions are starting to finally not accelerate as quickly. Um, you know, just imagine again, that party when, when things start to ramp down and, and we know it's a real trend because it lasts for several years. Um, that's what will make me feel optimistic and give me hope. So, so anyway, I, it's a, it's a complicated question. I, I know almost everyone assumes that the way to make change as quickly as possible is to try not to scare people too much. But I think, um, Personally, we should say, yeah, this is bad. Let's fight as hard as we can, save as much as we can. It's not too late. But we have to acknowledge it's really happening and it's pretty frightening. Yeah, that kind of ties into this next one. But just before we go into it, I think we've got time for just a couple more and then I'll pass to Etienne to wrap things up. But um, this one from Joan, given Ness's track and I guess everything you've just said, um, the facts. <laughs> How do your colleagues justify not being as concerned as you? Yeah, that's a that's a tough question. Um, I I don't really know. Um, um, like I, it's it's really hard for me to to speculate about what goes on in other people's brains. <laughs> um, you know, seventeen years an activist, and I, I like I don't understand how people are able to be in kind of full on climate denial, for for example. So so I, I guess what I would say is climate denial is a is complex and it's a spectrum, and it. It affects everyone, I think, at some level because it's so hard to. We're, I, I think, as mammals, you know, we're not designed to think about the planet as a whole, and we're so small compared to the planet as a whole that it's really hard to kind of to kind of accept this planetary change in our sort of mammalian brains, I guess. And it's uh, we have a lot. I think our brains are very good at kind of like choosing what we focus on and choosing what we exclude from our thoughts, sort of diso dissociating. 
Um, so I, I think that's sort of what's going on. It's it's certainly in some ways like it's easier to just do the science and not to really think too hard about the implications and not to really get deeply involved in activism. And are there some kind of simple, well, simple, but um, a few scientific responses that you could come up or give to to climate deniers or people that are kind of tagging on to, to the simple, um, yeah, the things that are used in climate denial communities? Do you have a couple of? I, I think, I don't think there's any way to get to them really, because I think they're, they're so willfully ignorant they're like they're choosing to be ignorant and the more evidence you give them the more they kind of feel defensive and like dig into their entrenched ignorance but i would just say you don't even have to look at the science anymore just like look around you like all the weird weather and like how hot things are getting in the summer and how all the trees in your neighborhood that used to thrive are dying and stuff like that <laughs> and then if you want to um you know uh then you can uh go to like a reputable website like NASA or something and read about it. But that's like, I think for climate deniers, that's like the black diamond slope. <laughs> I don't see a lot of them doing that. But come on, just like all like all around you, just open your eyes. <laughs> it's yeah, like, it's not hard. Like, yeah, if you're, if you're like, if your room is flooding with water, which is like five feet high, will you like still say that there's no water there? I mean, how, how much do you need? It's, it's insane. <laughs> Speaking of flooding, I'll say, oh, but it always floods sometimes. <laughs> you yeah. know, um, speaking of flooding, there's one here about what do you think about the projections for sea level rise? Um, uh, I think they're they're pretty probably pretty pretty good. I mean, <laughs> they're pretty scary. Um, uh, there's uh, again nonlinear things that could cause that cause sea level uh, rise to abruptly increase like uh, sea levels around the world and those things are really hard to project uh, and to get a handle on like um you know we know when the planet gets hotter um the, the water is going to expand that's about half of sea level rise so far has been just through thermal expansion and we know ice is going to melt and that's like most of the that's the other half of sea level rise um but it turns out that how giant ice sheets melt on a planet is fairly complicated. It's not like an ice cube melting in your in your glass. Um, and there's sort of dynamic components that uh, we're that we're still trying to understand and um, haven't really been modeled very well. So um, so so I, I think probably those things would tend to make the projections a little bit, if anything, uh, on, on the low side because the projections. You know, a lot of times the models, when there's these complicated dynamical things that we don't really understand, we basically just leave them out of the model. So um, that said, though, I, I for me personally, sea uh, level rise isn't my the thing that I'm the most worried about. So the people in the Marshall Islands and in parts of Bangladesh should probably disagree with that. But I'm more worried about just extreme human heat and uh, crop failures personally. Cool. I think that wraps up most of the audience questions. So thank you everybody for for sending them in and thank you for answering them, Peter. I'm going to pass back to Eti to Okay. Cheers. Thank you ever so much, uh, Peter. I really, uh, really appreciate it. And I just, uh, there's one thing that I'm always interested in, like sporting analogies, and I'm really interested in what you're saying here about telling the truth it's like as if you were you know five nil down in the football match and your coach yeah. came in halfway in the, in the half time and said guys we're cracking on brilliantly you know we're eight yeah. nine, you know just keep playing the way that you are we've got this wrapped up the trophies in sight and you know that just seems to me we've got a we've got a, as athletes we are used to actually looking at the score or the the speed or the distance or whatever and saying actually that's not what we want we need to do something else and i really appreciate your honesty here because it is tough sometimes to, to, to bring that i think that's a great analysis uh, that's a great analogy Etienne. and um yeah uh, laura asked in the chat if i would say anything else i would just really encourage uh you guys to nurture this um uh th this campaign that you have for for sport and uh, try to grow it into something as fast as you can. I think you've hit onto something here and um, it can probably feel frustratingly slow 
to get it off the ground, but keep at it. Uh, I, unfortunately, um, Mother Nature will probably be batting on your team, and uh, <laughs> and as more people get concerned, um, you know your ranks will swell and you'll start to have more and more impact. So thank you uh, for your leadership, all of you.